I'm extremely happy to finally have Professor Tony Pitassi among us. So Tony did her uh, PhD at the University of Toronto. Uh, then she was a faculty member at the University of Arizona and at the University of Pittsburgh before she moved back to the University of Toronto again in 2001. Um, Tony has made uh, deep contributions to computational complexity theory in general, in particular to the theory of concrete lower bounds in many areas, including uh, proof complexity, Boolean circuit complexity, communication complexity, differential privacy, and so on. <clears throat> and she has been um, uh, very widely recognized as an expert in these areas. Uh, she has been elected as an ACM fellow uh, in 2018. And uh, she was also a speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 1998. Uh, so with uh, not much further ado, I'll invite Tony uh, to, to talk. Thank you, Arkadev. It's, it's really great to be here. I've um, been wanting to come for a long time, so um, it's great to be here. <laughs> OK. Um, so I'm going to give mostly a survey talk about um, uh, communication, lower bounds in communication complexity using a technique that's called lifting. Um, I'm happy to go slowly if you have any questions. Um, I'm going to start by giving some applications of the lower, explaining the technique and then giving some applications of the lower bound and then I'll finish uh, with the remaining time to give some ideas of how to prove a lifting theorem. So most of the stuff that I'll be talking about at least for the first, I don't know, 40 minutes will be uh, most, mostly, it's with a bunch of people, but mostly it's joint with Mika Goose, who was a PhD student of mine, graduated a few years ago, Tom Watson, who was a postdoc, and Robert Robert, who was also a student of mine who graduated uh, two years ago. Um, and more or less, this is sort of a program to uh, prove lower bounds for stronger and stronger computational models, and I'll tell you where we get stuck. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about a new result that was obtained at the Simons Institute in Lower Bounds. That's what the picture is up there. And it was actually a lot of fun. I got to work with Arkadev, who I hadn't had a chance to work with for a while. He was a postdoc in Toronto, and we spent a lot of time together working on lots of fun things. So it was great to have a chance to work with him again. And Yuval Filmus, who was a previous student of mine, and Sajin and or Karath and Oramir. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, working on this result, so I'll tell you about this as well. Okay, so what I want to tell you about is basically this what a lower bound program um, where on the left you have the concrete model of computation that you're trying to prove the lower bound for. It's called, I'm calling that algorithms. In the middle is uh, communication, so we're going to convert the lower bound question in the concrete model to a question about in communication complexity. So we want to convert it to a question about an information bottleneck. And then to solve that problem, I want to basically use what's what, we'll call, what I'm calling a lifting theorem. And it's just a way of converting a simple decision tree or query type of a lower bound. So a lower bound in a simple computational model will show how to convert that sort of automatically via a lifting theorem into a lower bound for the, for the communication problem, an associated communication problem. So all the work is like between the pink and the green, the lifting, the general lifting theorem, and then uh, going from algorithms to communication. That's uh, I'll mostly use other people's results that I'll tell you about. <clears throat> okay, so so far we've been able to reprove all sorts of results using this 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 technique, and I'll tell you about how to reprove monotone formula and circuit lower bounds using this method and also explain how to use it to get lower bounds for monotone span programs. And then if there's time, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about how to use it to get lower bounds for extended formulations of linear programs and pseudo-deterministic models of computation. Um, there's other applications of lifting, um, but I won't talk about those today. I started off getting interested in it actually when Arkadev was in Toronto, uh, motivated by an applica applications in proof complexity. And um, yeah, so didn't realize back then how it would be a general tool that could be used to solve lots of problems. <clears throat> okay, so I'm, is every, I'm sure people, most people are familiar with communication complexity. If not, I'll, if not, I'll tell you what it is. So it's a, it's a wonderful model of computation that was um, defined by Yao in 79, and there's lots of variants of it, but the vanilla version is you have two players, Alice and Bob, and <clears throat> they each hold, say, an n-bit Boolean string, 
and they're trying to compute some joint function f, little f, of their input. And typically, in, you know, in previous applications until the last 10 years, usually the function little f was a Boolean function. I'm going to be mo much more interested in functions that are not Boolean and also search problems, so, and also partial functions. Um, but anyways, they want to compute this joint function f of their input. And so they have a protocol that they agree upon where they send bits back and forth. And at the end of the protocol, they should both know the value of the function. And the communication complexity of the function on inputs of length n each is the, you look at the best protocol, uh, so the best protocol pi and the minimum number of bits that they have to send back and forth over all inputs of length 2n, n, n and n. Okay? So that trivially, they can solve any problem by just one of the two players giving up and sending the other player their entire n-bit string. So the trivial protocol is I would just send, you know, if I'm Alice, I would just send Bob my whole string and make him do all the work. And so that's an n-bit protocol. Um, so what we're interested in is problems where there's a protocol of length more like constant or, or logarithmic. Okay, so everything's scaled down. Efficient would be polylog in n instead of polynomial in n. Um, and there's, you can define many flavors, just like in, for complexity classes, you can define randomized, different types of randomized, deterministic, non-deterministic, blah, blah, blah. Do this, you can do the same thing. There's this, all the same classes live in the communication world. And the two I'll mostly focus on today is the deterministic one, where the algorithm's deterministic, and they have to give you the right answer all the time with probability one. And then the randomized setting, where they're allowed to flip coins, and then they have to output the right answer with, say, probability at least two-thirds over all their coin flips. And here's an example, the equality function, where um, if they want to know if their strings are equal, and this can be solved quite easily using a randomized protocol with a constant number of bits if it's a public coin protocol. Uh, but the determinist, the complexity is, is maximal, it's linear. So one player basically has to ha send the entire string to the other player in order for them to determine deterministically what's the value. Okay. So again, I'll be interested mostly in search problems, total search problems. Uh, so for example, we'll, we'll see two examples that I'll come back to repeatedly. This is the karshmir vigdrasen search problem associated with a Boolean function. So say you have a Boolean function, little f, okay? Then the two players each gets, uh, Alice gets a one input of the function, and Bob gets a zero input of the function, and they want to find a coordinate i where, th where they differ. And since it's a well-defined function, there's always a, it's a total search problem, there's always at least one coordinate where they differ, since Alice has a one input and Bob has a zero, so their job is to find, find, find such a bit. And another problem that I'll come back to all the time, and it's going to turn out that these two problems are actually the same problem, is uh, the total search problem associated with an unsatisfiable CNF formula. So there's a fixed unsatisfiable conjunctive normal form formula, such as this one down here. And the only thing you have to know about it is it's unsatisfiable. And you somehow partition the variables into two halves, and you give, say, the x part to Alice, and the y part to Bob, and they get an assignment of all of the variables, and they want to find a violated clause, find a clause that's falsified by their joint assignment. Again, it's total because the formula is unsatisfiable, so there's always at least one clause that's false. Okay? Um, and so just to sort of uh, give you a flavor of uh, the, eventually I'm going to be more or less trying to communicate to you that, com that communication complexity in its generalizations are really about um, sort of uh, norms, of matrix norm operations on matrices. So it's, it's sort of like, it's really like st the study of linear algebra to a large extent. So I'm going to tell you about the communication matrix asso associated with a search problem. So I didn't label it, but the rows are labeled with all of Alice's possible inputs. So she has a string of length n. So it's two to the n rows corresponding to all her inputs and the columns are labeled with bobs, two to the n possible inputs, and an entry is, you know, all the possible answers that they, since it's a total search problem, that entry could be labeled with all possible legal answers. In this picture, there's five legal answers, one, two, three, four, five, with different colors, and you can see that, so this looks pretty, it's not always this pretty, but you can see that the matrix gets covered by these colors, and each entry has at least one color associated with it, because it's a total search problem, but some entries can have more than one color associated with it. Okay? 
And in a protocol, if Alice speaks first in a deterministic protocol, it partitions the rows into two halves, not necessarily so nice, but it's hard to draw it otherwise, so into two halves. And then when Bob communicates, again, that partitions each of those two halves. Now, now it partitions column-wise into two pieces and so on. And when they're finished with the protocol, what should happen is each, the, the whole matrix has been partitioned into subrectangles, and each subrectangle has to be covered, all the entries have to be covered by a single color because the, at that point they have to know an answer, so all the entries have to have, you know, there has to be a color, one color, at least one color that, where all those entries have that value. So this is a picture of an example. Does that make sense? So showing you it's already sort of some kind of a rank-like measure because in some sense you're partitioning the matrix into sort of rank one submatrices. Okay, so this technique of lifting that I referred to before is what I'm going to be spending my time on. And the idea is to start with a function little f. And I, I wrote it as a Boolean function, but again, it's not going to be a Boolean function typically for the applications. It's going to be a total search problem. Um, and it's on n bits, okay? And <clears throat> then what I want to do is understand little f in terms of a simple measure some query measure, which in the deterministic case, it would be deterministic decision tree complexity. So, or how many bits you have to know in order to know the value of the function. Does everybody know what um, decision tree complexity is? Nobody's saying. Should I tell you? Okay. <laughs> so for example, a decision tree over the variables x1 through xn, you would, it's a tree. Uh, and the vertices of the tree are labeled with variables, and there's two outgoing edges labeled 0 or 1. <clears throat> maybe this is labeled with x2, maybe this is labeled with x4, maybe this is labeled with x6. And at the leaves, you put the answer, the value of the value. So in the previous slide, the answers could be 1 through 5. If it's Boolean, the answers are 0 and 1. So you label these with the answer, whatever it is. And this computes a function in sort of the obvious way. Given an input, there's a unique path that's consistent with the input. So if, say, if the input is like, say, 0, if it's x1, x2, x3, x4, up to x6, and if the input, this is the 0, this is 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So for example, if the input is, <coughs> is all zeros, <coughs> then this would be the path that would be followed and that would be the value output, okay? And the complexity measure for a decision tree is the height of, uh, so again, for a given function f, you're looking at the best decision tree and the complexity of a particular decision tree is the height of it, okay? So, and the height of the decision tree is sort of telling you in the worst case over all the inputs, how many bits you have to know, know the value of in order to know the, the value of the function, okay? So it's a, it's a pretty simple, probably the most simple model of computation that we know of. And again, just like there's variance of communication complexity and circuit complexity and uniform complexity classes, you can go from deterministic to randomized, so on. We have the same thing for the query classes. You can have deterministic, there's randomized, and so on. Okay? And these are very well studied um, classes, and it's quite easy usually to prove lower bounds for decision tree complexity and the, and the other variants of it. So the idea here is to take a function little f where we completely understand its decision tree complexity. And then what we want to do is <coughs> compose little f with a gadget g. So g is another function. Think of it as a very small function, hopefully on a constant number of bits or polylogarithmic number of bits. And the composed function, the, the gadget g, it takes as input <coughs> typically two two inputs, an x and a y, where the x part will be given to Alice and the y part will be given to Bob. So the composed function <coughs> has as inputs x1 through xn, and those are going to be given to Alice, and y1 through yn, and those are going to be given to Bob. And so we're going to go from trying to understand the query complexity or the decision tree complexity of little, little f to the communication complexity of the composed function. Okay? And what we would like is that We'd like to show that there is some relatively simple gadget G with the property that no matter what little f is, when you do the composition, <clears throat> the communication complexity of the composed function is pretty much exactly the same 
is the query complexity of the, little, of the function little f. And if we can prove that, that's called a lifting theorem. If we can prove that, then we're in great shape to, to prove, you know, to use, we can just use everything we know about the de decision tree complexity. It translates sort of automatically to the communication setting, and then we're good to go. Okay, so that's what this says here. We want to translate the query complexity of f to the communication complexity of the composed function. Okay. Um, so, just to give you some motivation, all the lower, almost all the lower bounds that we know and love in communication complexity are already lower bounds for composed functions. So it's already something that people have been doing. It's just maybe it wasn't so explicit early on. So for example, <clears throat> set disjointness is like the most popular, the most, I don't know, the Arkadev and I wrote a survey all about set disjointness because it's the analog of satisfiability in the communication world. It's sort of the NP complete problem in the communication setting. Um, so set disjointness is just, you know, Alice is given an n-bit string, Bob's given an n-bit string, you view them as subsets of 1 through n, and you want to know if those sets are disjoint. Okay, and if they're, it's, it's actually reversed. So if they have a bit, if there's a, if there's a, a coordinate where they're both 1, in other words, the sets are not disjoint, then the value is 1, and otherwise, if, if they're disjoint, the value is 0. Okay, and set disjointness, if you view it, you know, in, in, as a composed function, it's the the, the outer function, little f, is the or function, and the, the gadget is just the and of two bits. Okay? And sure enough, it turns out that the decision tree complexity of the or function, um, by the way, I have my zeros and ones mixed up here, but the decision tree complexity of the or function is linear, and it's easy to see, you just, whatever variable is queried first, you just always take the path that says zero, and you have to know that all the bits are zero in order to know that, that the or function is zero. Okay? So any decision tree for the OR function is linear, and we also, the very famous results from, I don't know how many years ago, 20 years ago, shows that likewise the deterministic and the randomized complexity of disjointness is also, it's also maximal, it's linear. Okay. Okay, so once we have a lifting theorem, then we can use it, and one of the things that's nice about it is we, <clears throat> so first of all, we can get the intuition from the query world, and that intuition in that simple situation translates easily to the communication setting. And secondly, since we have both an upper and a lower bound on the communication complexity of the lifted problem, it's quite nice to work with. We can use it to get separations uh, for lots of different things since we have the upper and the lower bound. Okay. So there's been a whole bunch of lifting theorems in the last 10 years, roughly, and um, I'll just tell you about a few of them, some of the basic ones. So this was the first. There are some other theorems that were proven prior to this that are, that are also lifting theorems, or in the style of the lifting theorems, name, most notably Shurstov's theorems on the pattern matrix method. Um, but I'm going to consider this to be the first lifting theorem because it's the first one. It, it actually goes from deterministic decision trees to deterministic communication complexity. Okay. And this was proven originally by Ross and McKenzie, although they didn't state it as such. It was sort of embedded in a really beautiful proof that they had for separating levels of monotone circuit uh, classes. Um, but the theorem that they proved was f is, little f is an arbitrary n-bit Boolean function or search problem. And the gadget G is not so small. Uh, it's actually kind of a universal gadget called the index gadget, and it's lopsided. So one player, Alice, has uh, a string of length like, say, 20 log n or order log n. And Alice's input is much bigger. It's exponential in that, so it's n to the 20 long, so it's quite big. Uh, and the value of g on a pair x, y is basically, you think of x as pointing to a location in y, and it's that bit. So that's why it's like a universal function or universal gadget. Okay. And it might look bad to you that it's so big, but the, but the fact is the upper and the lower bound are usually dictated by the size of the shorter string. So, because remember, one player can always send their entire string to the other player. So in this case, there's always an upper bound um, <clears throat> for the gadget that's the size of the smaller input, which is order log n. Okay. So the theorem that they proved is that the decision tree, no matter what little f is, the decision tree complexity of little f is <clears throat> that times order log n is exactly equal to, well, there's, there's, there's uh, you know, theta. I mean, there, there's... There's constants in there, but it's equal to the communication complexity of the lifted problem. Okay. So the easy direction is if you have a protocol, if you have a decision tree 
for, for little f, you can automatically use it to get a protocol for the communication problem. How do you do that? Well, I should have called the z1 through zn. So typically, I'm going to be calling the outer function. I'm going to use the variable z to refer to the outer function. So. OK, and then when this gets converted into by the gadget g, this will become g of x1, y1, where in this case, x1 is a 20 log n bit string, and y1 is an n to the 20 bit string. Okay. So if we had this decision tree for little f, the way we convert it to a communication protocol is just to basically follow this tree. So if the first variable query to z1, then the players compute the gadget g on x1 and y1. And they do that in a trivial way, where Alice sends her, her, you know, her whole string to Bob. So that takes order log n to simulate that. And so the, that's why the communication complexity is order log n times the decision tree height. Okay. And this, the other direction is the hard direction to show that <clears throat> given an arbitrary communication protocol for the lifted function, it could be completely ugly, might have nothing to do with the decision tree, that you can somehow extract from it uh, a decision tree for the outer function. OK, so, so then we proved a randomized lifting theorem. So it's a very similar theorem, uh, but in the randomized setting. So if you start with a randomized decision tree, which is just a distribution over deterministic decision trees, <clears throat> and with the appropriate choice of gadget, we used in the original paper, we used the same gadget, <clears throat> that you can show that a lifting theorem in that setting, too. So that the randomized decision tree complexity of any function little f times theta of log n is exactly equal to the randomized communication complexity of the composed function. And this actually was a lot of work. It took a long time for us to get this. And then the new paper that I referred to with Arkadev and Yuval and Sajin and Orr, we kind of, I think we got a much nicer proof of this. And we sort of, the proof unifies the previous two theorems using the same technique. And it also is a little more versatile in terms of the gadget. So we, sh we show that more or less any gadget that has low discrepancy can work not just the special index one. And there was other papers. Arkadev has another nice, there's many papers between these that I'm not going to tell you about. Yep. So uh, the first theorem was the smallest gadget. Or if you know the first theorem. You're asking, what is the smallest gadget? It's not any better. Yep, so it's still an outstanding open problem to, to do better than order log n. OK, and then the last theorem that I may or may not get to is to show you that uh, there's another lifting theorem. That this one is for a constant size gadget. Uh, and this is sort of like, uh, I'll explain more later, but it's sort of if you, if you convert decision trees in the natural way into a linear, linear algebraic version of query complexity, you end up with something called null Stalinstadt's degree. And it's like, it's like polynomial degree. And that is going to correspond to a communication measure um, that, I'll, the, the, that I'll tell you about later. So we have a lifting theorem in that setting, too. OK, so I'll start by telling you how to reprove the lower bounds for monotone formulas, and then we'll see how it goes after that. <laughs> OK, so back to this picture. On the left is the model of monotone formulas. So this is uh, formulas over OR and AND, binary fan in, no negations. <laughs> and uh, we'll, also, we'll also talk about lower bounds for monotone circuits, which, again, instead of it being a formula or a tree, it's a DAG, so you can, you know, the computation can come together again. Still the fan out is 2, um, <clears throat> and it's still monotone. So it's still over OR and AND, but it's a circuit instead of a formula. So these were like classic results from quite a while ago with uh, sort of complicated proofs, and they're all different. And so we'll see how to prove both monotone formula bounds and circuit bounds the best that we know of using, using this technique. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so first I want to explain you how to convert. This is old, beautiful equivalence between monotone formula size or circuit depth and, uh, and the karshmir Riederson communication problem. I'll review that, and then I'll explain how to just use lifting to automatically get this monotone formula bound. OK, okay so the karshmir Riederson game, uh, I mentioned it on the first slide, but the search problem is so you start with a function f that's Boolean, and Alice gets a one input of the function. Bob gets a zero input, put, and they're trying to find a coordinate where they differ. Okay? And there's a monotone version of this game as well. Uh, there's a monotone version of this game as well, where the function f is monotone. 
And now they want to find not just a coordinate where they differ, but a coordinate where Alice's uh, xi is 1 and Bob's is 0. Okay? Okay, and the theorem that they proved, and the proof is really quite easy, but it's a really great way to think about formula size. They show that the formula size for any function f, Boolean function f, the formula size of f is equal to, this should say, the log of the communication complexity of the karshmer rudersen game associated with f. And equivalently, the circuit depth of any monotone, of any formula F, is equal to the communication complexity of the karshman vigerson game associated with F. And if F is monotone, then you get a monotone version of it. So if F is monotone, then the monotone formula size is equal to the log of the communication complexity, uh, <coughs> or in other words, the log of the circuit depth. Okay? So let me just tell you how the, the direction, there's an equivalence, but the direction that we mostly want is the direction that says if you have a monotone formula or a non-monotone formula of a, <clears throat> of a certain depth, we want to show how you can use that to solve the karshman rigerson game associated with it. And just look at this picture. Let's say this is our formula, okay? So remember, Alice has an input where the output gate evaluates to 1, and Bob has an input where the output gate evaluates to 0. So all they do is they trace a path from the root to a leaf. They know at the root, each of them, when they evaluate the root on their input, Alice is 1 and Bob is a 0. And if it's an, or, if it's an AND gate, like it is at the top, then we know that Bob's, on Bob's input, one of the two subtrees has to evaluate to 0. And on Alice's input, both subtrees have to evaluate to 1. So Bob would speak and tell Alice which way to go, which way to go so that his input is still 0 and her input is still 1. So he sends one bit telling her left or right when it's an AND gate. And when it's an OR gate, she sends one bit and says whether to go left or right. And so the total number of bits is just the depth of the tree. Okay? And if it's a formula, you can also be a little trickier, and you can get that it's the log of the formula size. Okay? So this is like an, another just an equivalent way to view proving formula lower bounds, okay? solving this. And notice it's not a Boolean communication problem. It's this, to, it's a total, it's this total search problem. OK, so we show that proving lower bounds for monotone formulas is equivalent to trying to prove lower bounds on the deterministic communication complexity of this monotone karshman rudersen game. And now we want to use lifting to get lower bounds on that using some kind of decision tree bound. Okay, and this is the second trick. Uh, and this trick is kind of in almost all of these works. But we're going to view the karshman rudersen game in a slightly different way that's going to be really productive, really useful. Uh, so let me try to explain that. So you have, remember before in the beginning, I told you about another type of total search problem that, w or that came from an unsatisfiable formula. So you have an unsatisfiable formula C, and the search problem associated with C, the ordinary search problem, is given an input, find a f falsified clause. And we can turn this into a communication search problem by just you know, splitting up the inputs into C in half, giving Alice half and Bob half, and it's the same thing. They want to find a clause that's violated. Okay. So one nice way, we don't have to do this, but one nice way to partition the inputs to make our job easier is to compose the original unsatisfiable formula F with the gadget G. So replace all the variables of the unsatisfiable formula C with this G with the gadget. So G, Z1 would be replaced by G of X1, Y1. Uh, and now they want to solve this search problem associated with the lifted CNF formula. So Alice gets the X inputs, Bob gets the Ys, and they want to find a clause that's violated. Okay. And it turns out, and this is not very hard to prove, <coughs> that more or less this, this search problem, this communication search problem, is equivalent to the monotone karshmer vigerson search problem. <coughs> so what that theorem stated was <coughs> that if you have an unsatisfiable CNF, and you partition the variables in any way into two pieces, that gives you a communication total search problem. And what the theorem shows is that you can view the inputs, you can view Alice's inputs, the, X, the assignments of the X ones, you can view those as one inputs to a monotone function associated with this unsatisfiable CNF, and you can view Bob's input as a zero input to a monotone function associated with C. And they're basically, it's the same, the karshmir rigerson search problem is, is the same as this one. Does that make, make sense? So I was going to try to do the proof of this, but I, I'm out of time. So 
uh, I'll skip it, but anyways, this is just saying that we can always transform a, a lifted search problem like this into uh, an equivalent karschmidt richardson game for an associated monotone function. Okay, so this means, putting this all together, I'm gonna skip the proof, <coughs> that all we have to do is uh, start with some unsatisfiable, unlifted CNF where we know that finding a violated clause in the decision tree model is, is linear, okay? And that's really easy to do. Okay, there's all sorts of unsatisfiable formulas, the pigeonhole principle, random CNFs. There's all sorts of unsatisfiable formulas where any decision tree for finding a violation requires linear height. And that's, by the way, that's equivalent to uh, talking about the um, DPLL resolution uh, height. So decision tree complexity of finding the clause is exactly the same is the DPLL height. Uh, DPLL is Davis, Putnam, Lo Loveland, Logan. It's a, it's a tree-like resolution method for, for proving that a form is unsatisfiable. So if you start with an unsatisfiable CNF where you know its decision tree height is linear, like I said, that's easy. And then using the equivalence between, then you lift that, you lift that unsatisfiable CNF in the way we described and that gives you the lifted search problem, and that's equivalent to the karschmidt rigdorsen game for an associated monotone function. So by the lifting theorem, that automatically gives us uh, linear lower bounds on the, on the communication complexity of the monotone karschmidt rigdorsen And then by the equivalence of monotone formulas, that finally gives us the lower bound, okay? Yeah, so at the end of the day, putting it all together, all you have to do is start with an unsatisfiable formula where you have a very simple type of a lower bound for it, and then once you, and then with the with that together with the lifting theorem automatically gives you monotone formula lower bounds. Okay. Well, we got lots of. I'm 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 I'm, I'm trouble. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> okay. And this result was was uh, so an open problem was to show that this works not just for monotone formulas but for circuits. And until a couple of years ago, we didn't know how to use the lifting technology to prove circuit bounds. But in a really lovely paper um, from a couple of years ago, they used the randomized lifting theorem that I mentioned uh, to prove lifting for what's called, an, uh, uh, instead of communication trees, for communication DAGs. And that, in turn, corresponds to monotone circuits. So all of the same stuff with a new, lift, with, with a new lifting theorem uh, that builds on the randomized lifting theorem uh, enables you to reprove uh, the famous uh, monotone circuit bounds that, have, that were proven by Rasbroff in, I don't know, the, the 80s, I think. And one thing that's really nice about this proof is it's actually quite different than, than the old proofs. So the old proofs were like bottom up, you used sunflowers or you used method of approximations, and this is really a, a much different proof. It's like a top-down proof. It gets pretty similar lower bounds, though. Everybody's looking to see this <laughs> Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about um, the, the linear algebra lifting theorem that I mentioned that, uh, that we can use to get lower bounds for linear secret sharing schemes, which are sort of equivalent to monotone span programs. So here is the same picture, but on the left, the structured model of computation, I'll tell you what this means in a minute, is monotone span programs. That's a generalization of monotone formulas. Uh, and they actually end up being equivalent, strangely enough, to linear secret sharing scheme complexity. So that's the model of computation, and we'll show uh, sort of the analog of karschmer vigdorsen uh, which was proven by Anna Gall quite a while ago, a beautiful result that shows that the <clears throat> complexity of these can be characterized by a generalization of the karschmer vigdorsen uh, by a generalization of communication complexity that I'll tell you about, and then we can use this new lifting to, on the right there, instead of, um, instead of decision tree height, it's sort of like polynomial degree. Okay, so I'll start with, see, people know what secret sharing schemes are? I didn't know much about them until a couple of years ago. So secret sharing is very cool. Very, if you don't know about it, it's, I think it's really cool. And there's lots of, lots of open problems. This is a wide open area if you're looking for something to work on. So you have somebody that wants to share a secret S with uh, select subsets of of a population, okay? So maybe she wants to share her secret with the green and the pink and the purple, but she doesn't want to share her secret with any group of people that doesn't include one of those special groups, 
Yeah, so maybe she wants like a parent in the room or something, <laughs> or a giraffe in the room, so she wants special groups. And, and what she does is she sends a message to each of the players, okay? And then with that message, the, for example, the pink group should be able to get together and figure out what the secret was using their shared messages. But, and likewise for the green and the purple, but any other subset uh, like this group over here that doesn't, that's not one of the special ones should not be able to reconstruct S, should not be able to learn anything about the secret S. And the question is how big do these shares, these messages, how big do they have to be in order to compute, in order to do this? Okay. Um, and this is an old problem from 79. And so you have, think of it as n parties, so the population is n people. And you have subsets p1 through pm, okay? And the question is how long can these, how long do these messages have to be? And there is an upper bound of 2 to the n bits, which is terrible. And the question then that's still wide open is whether you can do better than this in general, okay? And a lot of focus was on linear secret sharing schemes where the messages are actually linear functions. And even there, it was sort of this, this, this was studied in the 80s and early 90s a lot to try to even prove lower bounds in that case. Uh, and there's a lot of sequence of papers that led to some beautiful results that led to a quasi-polynomial lower bound. That was the best that was known. And, um, and using this technique, we were able to get like, exponential bounds for this problem. It's still totally wide open in the nonlinear regime uh, wh wh what's happening. Yeah, so it's information theoretic. So it means that any subset that doesn't include one of the special subsets should not, information theoretically, should not be able to learn anything about the secret. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And for, for the subsets you want to share, they, they should exist. Yeah, you know, That's right. The That's right. That's right. And, and, and one thing that people have uh, looked a lot at is, <clears throat> so you can look at the complexity of the subsets and try to understand how big the shares have to be is a function of that complexity. And if the complexity is low, then the shares are equally low. But if you don't bound the complexity, it's not known if you can do better than 2 to the n. There was a breakthrough result that did slightly better than 2 to the n. It's, like, it's, still, two, it's still exponential, but the, there's a constant that's, uh, I forget exactly what it is, but it's slightly better than the trivial 2 to the n bound. Um, but it's really wide open, like completely wide open. Yeah, so it's a great problem. Um, yeah, so I'll show you how, once you have this lifting theorem, you get this, like, you know, really easily. I um, mean, it also sort of, because this model of monotone span programs uh, includes not just monotone span programs, but monotone branching programs, monotone formulas, secret channel schemes, you get sort of like the same proof, one unified proof for all of this stuff. Okay, so I'm going to just briefly describe what monotone span programs are. Like I said, it turns out that um, you can relate the... The, comple the, the complexity of a monotone function in this model turns out to be equivalent to the linear secret sharing s scheme size of the corresponding uh, groups. Okay. So a monotone span bar, I really like this model of computation. It was defined by Karshver and Vigerson quite a while ago. And um, you, I think of it as like the linear algebraic natural extension of monotone formulas, but it's actually in some sense, stronger than a monotone computation. It can even do things that polynomial size circuits, monotone circuits can't do. So in some sense, it's incomparable to these monotone models. Anyways, you describe a span program by a matrix, okay? And the inputs are, you label the rows with the input bits, and you, it's important that you can label, uh, you can use, you can, uh, the same input bit can label many different rows. So in this case, uh, X2 is, occurs twice, but typically it might occur many, many times. Uh, and, so, and then you label each row with some vector over whatever field you're in. And then you say that an input alpha is accepted by the span program. Alpha is an assignment to the Boolean variables X1 through Xn, in this case X1 through X5. You say that an input's accepted if you look at the, um, you look at the rows that are labeled with variables that are consistent with the assignment. So in this case, x1, x2, and x5 are 1. So the rows labeled x1, x2, and x5 are consistent. So you're allowed to use those rows. And then you want to know if the all 1 vector is, in the, is spanned by these rows. And if it is, then you accept this input. And if it's not, you don't. Okay? And this is the monotone version of it. 
but there's a non-monotone version of it as well where you can label the rows by literals, either variables or their negation. Same idea, you light up the rows that are consistent with the input and you want to know if one is in the span. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so like I said, these are sort of equivalent models even though they look quite different. Uh, and that's the, that's the, <clears throat> the model of computation we're interested in. And it turns out that the complexity is equivalent to a particular uh, communication uh, type of model that I'll tell you what it is now, it's called algebraic tiling. And it's sort of the natural, in my mind, the natural algebraic generalization of, uh, of ordinary uh, communication complexity. So I'm going to define this now. It's called an algebraic tiling. This is the same matrix you saw in the beginning, the communication matrix. And again, it's a total search problem. So it's the same matrix you saw before. Rows are labeled with one in, all the one inputs. Columns are labeled with all the zero inputs. And here I just drew five separate matrices, one for each of the different possible answers, where I just drew the, all the stuff that was labeled one in its own matrix. Okay, so nothing's happening here. I just drew them all separately so you could see them a little better. And a tiling is we're going to we can get to construct five matrices, one for each possible answer to the search problem. And matrix A1, again, we're over some field. Matrix A1 has to be zero outside of the yellow area. It's inside the yellow area, it can be anything you want, okay? Any values in the field that you want. Likewise, A2 has to be completely zero outside of the blue area and so on, okay? And then you have these matrices and what you require is that they, uh, entry-wise sum to the all one, all one matrix, okay? And the complexity of the tiling is the sum of the ranks of these constructed matrices A1 through A5. So it might look weird, but just to point out that the, if you have a deterministic protocol, it gives you uh, a tiling. It's a special case of a tiling. Um, let's see if I drew a picture. I didn't draw a picture. Well, I have it earlier. So remember what a, what a regular protocol was, it partitioned, it was a partition of the original matrix into monochromatic subrectangles. Okay, so it had the property that all of the non-zero entries, uh, so for A1, all of the, all of the subrectangles that give the answer one, they would all, I would put ones everywhere in A1 corresponding to all those subrectangles. And that has to all be contained in the yellow part because the answer is one. And, so I have ones and zeros in the yellow part, and I have zeros everywhere else, and likewise for all the other ones. So it actually is a zero one matrix, and further, like the fact that it sums to one is sort of trivial because each entry is one in exactly one place and zero everywhere else. Okay, and the the, the sum of the ranks is just the you know the, it's just the total number of sub rectangles in the in the in the part you know in the in the partition of the rectangle in the monochromatic sub rectangles. Okay. So this is, that's why I think of this as the linear algebraic extension of that because now it's, you, you don't just have to have a one or a zero in every entry where every place has exactly one one, but you can have various values. Uh, you know, if you have a, a, a place in the matrix that could be yellow or it could be blue, then you can put a number into the yellow part and a number in the blue part as long as it sums to one over the field. Okay. So it's a more powerful, it's, it, it enables you to get a smaller, smaller, complexity, possibly. Okay. So that's why it's a more powerful model. And what Anna Gall proved, this beautiful result, is that, um, that the, the, the log of this complexity is exactly the same as the monotone span program size. So the log of the complexity of the, of the tiling is exactly the same as the size of the monotone span program, which is also exactly the same as the is the, uh, uh, the size of the messages in the linear secret sharing, you know, the optimal size of the messages in, the linear, in any li linear secret sharing scheme corresponding to that, uh, those subgroups that correspond to the function that you're trying to get the lower bound for. Does that make sense? And then, so then if we want to prove lower bounds for monotone span programs, we convert it to this generalization of communication complexity. Yes. Can you say that one more time? Um, so you're wondering, so there's a non-monotone non version of it also. The difference is that these rectangles, it's a little hard to describe because I did, it in, I did it right away for the search problem. So you could think of these colors, these A1, A2, A3, if, if it's the monotone, if it's a monotone function, then there'll be N of those in the monotone case 
where you know <laughs> x1 would be if um, uh, if if uh, so a1 would be like if if Alice is x1 is 1 and Bob's y1 is 0 in the non-monotone version of the thing there it would be you know it, it could go either way yeah. yeah good question okay so what I want to do is just explain to you this lifting theorem that we get between tiling and null stone sets proofs and I hope it's somewhat convincing that this really is just the analog the linear algebraic analog of the deterministic one that we did so I'm going to replace decision tree height with polynomial degree okay so you don't really have to the same way that decision tree height so again we're going to do the same trick we did before where we have the unsatisfiable formula lift that that's going to correspond to you know Karshma Vigderson situation so I'm going to do that same trick the in the same way that once you have an unsatisfiable formula and you're trying to understand the decision tree height, that corresponded to proving a lower bound for a very weak proof system, namely tree-like resolution proofs. In the same way, the polynomial degree required to find a violation um, for an unsatisfiable CNF is exactly what we call null stone sets refutations. You don't really need to know that. Maybe this is the better definition for now. So you have an unsatisfiable CNF, okay, and we're going to convert it to, you know, low degree polynomials, uh, and then the null Stolensatz degree of this unsatisfiable collection of low degree polynomials is just we want to have, uh, you know, small degree polynomial that solves a search problem, okay? So that's, that's all null Stolensatz degree is. Okay, so you give it its input and assignment to the variables, and it should output a violated clause. And you're looking at a polynomial over the reals or over some field, and you want to know what's the what's the minimal degree of any polynomial that does that. Okay? And if it bothers you that the polynomial is outputting a value instead of zero one, you can just convert it to zero one by, you know, for each each clause, you can have a separate polynomial where it's it should say one if that's the clause that's violated, and zero otherwise. So again, it's like a, gives you a partition of all the assignments where for each assignment there should be exactly one. Uh, polynomial that says one. Does that make sense? <laughs> and so the lifting theorem that we prove that I proved with Robert Robert is mostly Robert's work uh, is uh, going from null null Stolensatz degree or polynomial degree of solving the search problem to you know through algebraic tiling to monotone span program size. Okay. And so put all this together, you end up with you know all you have to do is prove lower bounds on polynomial degree for an unsatisfiable formula, such as random CNFs, and then you automatically get these, these lower bounds on linear secret sharing schemes. And unlike the other lifting theorems, one thing that's really cool about this is that the gadget, the inner gadget here is constant size, and actually where's Mark? He's here somewhere. He was one of the people on the later paper, Mark Vignal. Um, so this is actually the gadget G is a constant size gadget, um, which means that there's almost no loss so you really do end up with like truly, truly exponential lower bounds over here. So in particular, it gives you lower, truly exponential lower bounds on monotone formula size. Okay, so I probably went on too long. I think, okay, you have a choice. I have maybe eight minutes left. I can either tell you a little bit about the proof or I can tell you about a third application. I'm a little bit more inclined to tell you about the proof, but why don't you raise your hand if you would rather hear about another, uh, this last application. Okay, and raise your hand if you'd rather hear a little bit about the proof. Oh boy, I, why did I do that? <laughs> okay, we can split into two. Okay, maybe I'll, 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 I'll split the difference. I'll do four and four. <laughs> four minutes and four minutes. Okay, so pseudo-determinism is a, a very cool notion that I learned about from Shafi Goldwasser at Simon's Lower Bound meeting, but I guess it's been around for a while. Uh, and it's, it's a notion of randomization for search problems or for functions but where you, and that you're allowed to use random coins, but you have to always give the same answer. So for a Boolean function, it's not interesting because there's only one answer, okay? But for, uh, for a search problem where there can be more than one answer, you want, to, you want an algorithm, you're allowing randomization, but what you want is this very high probability over the random coins, you always get the same answer, okay? And they ask this question, you know, they define this, this model called pseudo-deterministic algorithms. You can define it for, you know, decision trees, communication complexity, whatever. And they asked, what is the power of it relative to ordinary randomized computation? Uh, and one motivation uh, that they gave for it is sort of related to, like, reproducibility in science. 
or machine learning algorithms even, processes where there's a lot of randomness, and often it's contentious whether things can be reproduced. So if you had a pseudo-deterministic algorithm, then, you know, somebody should be able to run it with their own random coins and should be able to get the same answer. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to really go through this whole thing, but I'm going to just tell you the tell you a little bit about the, the decision tree lower bound, okay, and then you can use, use uh, modifications of what I've been talking about to get, to, to, to get a similar separation in the communication world. So here's like the classic problem that you would think should be easy, randomized, and should be hard, well it is hard deterministic, and you also think it should be hard pseudo-deterministically. So call it, it's a promise problem called find one. So you have a vector of n bits, and you're promised that half of them are one, at least half of them are one, okay? And you want to find a one, okay? And we want to study the <coughs> decision tree complexity of this. So if it was an ordinary deterministic decision tree, the height would still be linear because I would just, you know, whenever somebody queries, I would just follow the zero side, and I would be able to go n over two steps, seeing all zeros, before I was forced to give a one. So the height would be n over 2, okay, lower bound. And the question is, what about in the randomized case? So in the randomized case, it's easy, because all you have to do is, like, guess a coordinate, and you have a 50-50 chance of getting a good coordinate. So if you guess a few times, log times, all of a sudden your probability of being right is really high. Okay, so randomly it's easy, but notice that you always get a different answer. And it's, in some sense, it's not really a guarantee of much. Whereas a pseudo-deterministic algorithm is allowed to flip coins, but it has to almost always give you the same answer. Um, so the question is, can you prove a lower bound for find one? Um, so there's, it's not that hard to see that you can get some lower bound into the epsilon. Um, uh, what we prove here is a square root of n lower bound. I think the answer is linear. Um, I was going to announce linear, but I'm not, I didn't check everything yet. So the answer, we, we might have a linear bound, but for sure we have a square root of n bound. Um, and the, the, so the way to, or a nice way to get the, this improved bound is, again, to go, go through this CNF trick. Uh, so the proof idea is that you start with an unsatisfiable random CNF, okay? So if think of a random CNF, 3 CNF, okay, with maybe like, I don't know, 100 N clauses. So fix one that's unsatisfiable and with a property that, like, a constant fraction, on every assignment, a constant fraction of the clauses are always false. Okay, and for almost any random CNF with that many clauses, this will be true. Okay, so for every assignment, a constant fraction of the clauses will be false. So then we can ask our same question of find a violation. Okay, and that is sort of like embedded in find one, because you're always going to have on every input vector, on e so you can think of on, a, on an input, on an assignment to the to the variables of the CNF, the n variables, you can associate with it uh, a vector of length 100 n, however many clauses there are, and you put a 1 in a position C i, you, you put a 1 in position i if clause i is false. And since the unsatisfiable formula had a constant number of violations for any assignment, each assignment is going to convert to a vector of still linear length that's going to have a constant fraction of 1s. Okay? So that means that, again, the randomized complexity of finding a 1 is easy. Uh, and we want to prove a pseudo-deterministic lower bound. The randomized algorithm that always gives you the same answer with high probability is going to require like in square root of n. And the nice thing about converting to the search problem um, is that, again, we can just now use lower bounds that we already have on null Stolensas degree that will automatically give us lower bounds with a little bit of more work for, for, for this question. And this problem, like, like I said, it embeds in find one. It's just it's a particular sub-collection of all the vectors that have a constant number of ones. But it's, it's a nice collection. It's easier to work with because it has like, good expanding properties. So the same way that before we were able to use unsatisfiable CNFs and nice properties of them, and just use those properties together with general theorems to get lower bounds, we kind of can do the same thing here. So that's all I'm going to say about this, unless you have any questions. Okay, so just a few words about this, the lifting theorem, and this I'm going to talk about the, 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 the newer one. Well, I'm not going to get into many details, but I'm just trying to give you a flavor for it. So this is the statement of the theorem that the randomized decision tree complexity of little f, regardless of what little f is, uh, is more or less equal to the randomized communication complexity of the composed function. And here, g, the gadget, 
is I'm going to be uh, B bits. Alice gets B bits, and Bob gets B bits. And B has to be something like, it's still omega log n, so think of B as order log n. And we get the same kind, but we get the same kind of statement as before. Um, this works for any gadget G that has sufficiently low discrepancy. Um, but you can just think of a fixed G if you want. Okay, so how are you going to prove this? I just want to give you some flavor for how do you prove this. So what you, the way we proved it is a constructive argument. So somebody gives you a protocol, a randomized, let's just do the deterministic case. So somebody gives you a deterministic protocol for the composed problem, and you have to somehow extract from it a decision tree for the outer function. Okay, so we want to come up with a constructive algorithm. I hand you a protocol, you run the protocol somehow and construct a decision tree out of it. Okay, so how are you going to do this? Um, so what we want to do on any input z, z is an input to the function little f, we want to somehow simulate the protocol um, on all of the x, y inputs that are consistent with this z. Okay, we want to simulate the protocol on those. And, and instead of querying, you know, x, x, the x's, we want to query the z's. Okay. So the, the weird thing is, is how can you do this when you don't know the z's? You don't know the z's until you query them. Okay. So the only thing really that you can do is so when Alice sends, let's say Alice speaks first, so she's going to send some message. So she's going to partition her all of her possible x's, x, you know, values for x1 through xn into two halves, and <coughs> All you can really do is sort of, you know, simulate this with a randomized, you know, ran think of it as just going left or right with probability proportional to how big her two pieces are. So she partitions all of her inputs into two pieces of size like a quarter fraction and three quarter fraction, then intuitively we'd want to go left with probability a quarter and right with probability three quarters. We haven't queried anything yet because this, it's allowed to be a randomized decision tree, okay? So we went, that's what we want to do, and we want to hope for the best. But at some point, uh, and we're, so we start by simulating the protocol on this uniform distribution, but eventually the protocol pi is going to sort of transmit too much information about some particular coordinate, uh, so coordinate of, of, of z, so some, some zi. Okay? So at that point, we, wanna, we want to actually make our decision tree query this variable zi, so going left or right. But after we clear, and then we want to continue the simulation. So we want to have some measure of information when too much information has been learned about a coordinate. When too inf much information has been learned about a coordinate, then we want to query that bit, and then we want to carry on. Okay? Of course, there's some issues here. One issue is when you query that bit, that's going to partition you know, all the xy's into two pieces, and now you might lose the, the property that, that those two pieces, you don't know anything about the remaining coordinates. So you have like a lot of cleanup to do in a sense. Um, so the invariant that, that we maintain is this is sort of a measure of information about subsets of coordinates. Uh, so let me just go back to the very high level. So we're going to simulate the protocol pi, like I said, going left or right with probability proportional to the size of the current sub-rectangle, sub as long as there's no uh, coordinate or subset of coordinates where we've learned too much information. Okay? And we'll call that dense. As soon as some, some subset of coordinates, say one coordinate, too much information has been learned about it, maybe Alice sent a message and all of a sudden too much is learned about, say, x, x, you know, the, the third coordinate, the x part. So at that point, we're going to uh, query that coordinate, so query that coordinate, and go left or right, and that partitions all of the x and y strings into two parts, the left part being the part where that coordinate has the value 0, and the right part where the coordinate has value 1. And, but then the problem is we could have lost our invariant on the remaining coordinates. So then you have to do a cleanup to restore the invariant in a way that doesn't remove too much stuff. So the new proof, what it does is it sort of looks at what happens when you do, when you do query a coordinate. Uh, and there are some situations, that, troublesome situations that you can get into. Uh, so we define a notion of dangerous, which is like particular values that leak too much information. Okay, so there are some bad strings that leak too much information. And what we basically have to do is argue that there's not too many of these dangerous values. So they can be discarded. And once they're discarded, you're back to this nice uniform situation where you can carry on the protocol. This is super high level, and you might not have gotten anything out of this. Um, so we can talk about it sometime if you want to know more or ask architects. <laughs> um, but that's a, sort of at a very high level how, how the argument goes. 
Um, yeah, so just to wrap up, so one question that I'm interested in is whether we can prove similar lifting theorems instead of for communication complexity, for information complexity. Um, and this would be great for a lot of reasons because there's a lot of applications. Well, first it would just be interesting because for information complexity, we know that communication and information aren't always the same. So not all protocols can be compressed. So it would be interesting if in the lifted situation that didn't happen. So if we pr could prove a lifting theorem in the information complexity setting that would take us from decision tree complexity to information complexity, then that would sort of tell us for composed functions, uh, you know, th there's no difference between the two. And the other reason it's interesting is there's lots of nice applications where you really do need the, str seems, you seem to need the stronger information complexity bound. For example, in differential privacy, which is a, an application of uh, one area that where a lot of lower bounds are obtained by information complexity bounds. So you asked the question before, so we still don't have lifting theorems for constant size gadgets for the simple deterministic setting or the randomized setting. Um, and of course, the, the big open problem is to try to move our way away from, non -mono away from monotone computation and try to figure out how to solve the real problem, which is to prove the lifting theorem for non-monotone computation and therefore maybe to get non-monotone formula lower bounds. And even if we could break that into the third barrier, um, in this way, that would be great. So that's all.